Good day. My name's Don Tipping. I'm here at Seven Seeds Farm, which is also the home of Siskiyou Seeds. And I wanted to share some thoughts and observations I've made about photo period in the sun as it relates to gardening and growing plants. In my particular instance, growing seeds. So, as far as I see it, there are two predominant forces in nature. There is the cosmic and the earthly. And as it relates to plants, we have fire and air are the cosmic forces, and then earth and water are the earthly forces. So there's our four elements that are often characterized in the Western alchemical view or the indigenous North American worldview. So the sun, we're next to this star. We're 93 million miles away, but we are next to this star that we call the sun. Its light takes about seven minutes to get to us here at the speed of light. And here on Earth, as Jacques Cousteau famously said, perhaps we shouldn't call this planet Earth, but we should call it water because it's mostly covered by water. So the interaction between those two forces of the sun and water are really the, what allow plants to be a conduit for that synergy. So plants are basically taking minerals from the soil through their roots and uptaking water in the soil through their roots again. And oftentimes in a relationship with a mycorrhizal association, but we'll leave that perhaps for uh, another talk about fungi. So they're taking up minerals and water, they're combining it with photons that they're consuming from the sun, and then they're giving off oxygen, which facilitates all the other aerobic life on the planet, including us humans. And then their byproduct is carbon dioxide in the air, or in the instance of woody perennials like a tree, when they die and they fall over and go back to the soil, is stored carbon. So, for instance, the trunk of a tree is largely just pure carbon from the sun. And most of the minerals that they've taken from the soil is in the finer leaves and twigs and branches and so on. So that's woody perennials. But as far as uh, we're concerned as gardeners, I think it's important to consider what an important force the sun is here. And here in Western Oregon, we're in late spring now on our journey around our solar calendar towards the summer solstice. So which the length of the day is the obviously most of us know is the longest that we'll reach in the entire revolution around the sun in our year. So for us here, we're at 42 degrees north latitude here in Southern Oregon, which is right by the Oregon-California border. An interesting exercise to go through is to draw a line from wherever your latitude is on the planet easy to figure that out around the earth so uh, around 42 degrees north latitude we go through Michigan Maine we go through uh, the southern coasts of Spain and France uh, we go through northern Italy uh, we go through Turkey uh, Bulgaria Mongolia, North Korea, and the North Island of Japan, Hokkaido. And then if you want to really open up your imagination, uh, look at the 42nd or whatever degree latitude you happen to live at in the Southern Hemisphere. And for me, that's where uh, I really started to have my imagination massaged by what plants could I grow here in Southern Oregon that people aren't currently so in the Southern Hemisphere, we're gonna go through Southern Chile. Uh, we're gonna go through New Zealand, Tasmania. Um, there's not, <laughs> nothing else but ocean, basically. So those are our two reference points. Um, but when I consider that here in 
where I live is the same latitude as Monaco, Monte Carlo, which we imagine as sunny beaches and you know easy living, where you could grow citrus and olives, or North Italy, where obviously citrus, olives, figs, they all thrive. So, you know, there's more to the equation than just pure hours of day length, but here, what I've experienced in Oregon is if you have a greenhouse to protect you against the either excessive rainfall or the uh, temperature swings that can happen in winter from wet, mild, temperate rainforest, which is predominantly what our ecology here in Cascadia, which Cascadia describes the larger bioregion that really goes from coastal southern Alaska down through all the rivers that drain from the Cascades to the west, to the Pacific Ocean. And that's gonna include the Snake River Canyon, that's gonna include the Columbia River Basin. Um, once you get down south of where I'm at, uh, of the Cascade volcanoes, which are gonna include Mount Shasta, Mount McLaughlin, Mount Lassen, and the southern portion of the region, we get into the Sierra bioregion, which again is rivers that drain to the west. That's, that's really its own bioregion, but back to Cascadia, um, we tend to have these mild, wet winters, but we periodically can have a dry spell where it can get into the teens. That's a little harsh for citrus. It's, uh, olives can't hang with that. Uh, sometimes even fig trees will be killed back to the roots. But our, again, back to this idea of photoperiodicity, these are plants that have evolved in cultivation for thousands of years to be adapted to those types of day lengths. So, for us, with a simple single layer of uh, plastic or glass or polycarbonate unheated greenhouse, we can grow all those things, citrus, olives, uh, loquat, um, what else are we pulling off? Uh, pineapple guava, bananas, um, Suriname cherry, uh, sugar cane, mate, which again, southern hemisphere plant. Um, and I've been doing this for years, so I know it's possible. Uh, pomegranates are another notable uh, plant that's actually a citrus relative. So there's something to consider. Let's go back to the idea of latitude and adaptation. Um, so China is about the, there's areas in China the same latitude as here. Onions evolved in China. So onions are in the Aliaceae, the lily family, they're related to daffodils, tulips, that kind of thing. So and you can see we eat this, uh, this root, uh, but it's not really a root, it's a bulb because there's roots that emerge from the bottom of the bulb. So it's a swollen bulb that's a mechanism for storing carbohydrates for it to complete its biennial life cycle. So it's gonna start as a seed in the early spring as soon as it can germinate and onions can germinate in cold, moist conditions. It's gonna grow, uh, make, grow upwards towards the sun. So again, think of that photo period, those elongating days between, let's say, February and the summer solstice, where it's just growing leaves and going up. And then after we reach the solstice, our, the day lengths begin to decline and the nights are longer. And that sends a trigger to that plant that's highly photosensitive. All of the, uh, the alliums have some degree of photosensitivity in terms of day length adaptation. So that's why we talk about long day onions and short day onions. So being here in the north, we're in an area where we can grow long day onions, but if you're in Hawaii, you can't, or if you're in Georgia, you can't, you need a short day onion that's adapted to that level of photoperiodicity. And this, I'm trying to explain why is this so. So again, plants elongating, elongating, summer solstice happens, all of a sudden it's like, okay, direct more sugars into developing that storage mechanism, the bulb, um, and then usually between summer solstice and for us, we're harvesting onions in early July, uh, that's when they're bulbed up and the tops begin to dry down. So in nature, if we go back to like the primordial relatives of the bulbing onion in uh, China and those, the river floodplains where that emerged, it would senesce, basically complete its, or, or put a pause in its life cycle because the onions never truly die. Um, I should kill them by some mechanism, but in nature, it senesces, it, meaning its leaves dry down and all of the sugars are stored in that bulb. 
And then it's just gonna hang out there. Like if we didn't disturb it, it would just sit there in the ground from August until, you know, maybe two months later in October when the soil moisture, the rains return and we're past the fall equinox too, key point here. And then it begins to grow again. And it takes it a little while for until you can actually see tops emerging. And then it goes through the winter as a basically scallions. And then after uh, the winter and in early spring, after the spring equinox, it sends up a flower stalk and then makes seed that is ready pretty much in August of the next year. So you can see how it's a biennial. It's completing its life cycle in that way. It's like it has a little internal clock. Another uh, story I can share from my own experience that underscores this idea of, of photo period adaptation is when we tried to grow Teosinte, which is the ancestor species to corn. So Teosinte, the Latin name is Zia Mexicana because it was a wild grass, wild subtropical grass in Mexico. And the modern corn that we grow is Zia maize, which is why the rest of the world besides the U.S calls corn maize because that's the species name of the, the plant. So when we have tried to grow Teosinte here, it grows just fine. You know, we wait till after the risk of frost and we put out little transplants because we wanted to baby it. And I've tried this a few times. And then it grows and grows and grows and grows. It elongates and it loves our long summer days because for us at the time of planting, it's getting dark at 9.30 or 10 these incredibly long days. And then as we move towards fall equinox, which for us at this latitude is 12 hours a day, 12 hours of night, because we're so close to the 45th parallel, which is halfway between the equator and the poles. And that's where you truly have 12 hours each, um, whether you're north or southern hemisphere. So what this cute little teosinte does, it just grows and grows, and then it becomes this giant plant, and then it begins to flower in September, and make these tiny ears that if we're lucky, if we have a you know, delayed frost that particular year, we might get some seed, but generally it doesn't. The same thing happens when we try and grow these cool uh, indigenous heirloom Peruvian corn. Some people have seen them, they have uh, kernels like the size of one of the digits of my thumb and is used in all these different preparations, oftentimes as a beverage in uh, Peru and the Andes. And the cobs, rather than being long and cylindrical, they're sort of short and stubby and with spaces in between. They're really beautiful, all sorts of different things. But again, the highlands of Peru, or most of the Andes, is fairly equatorial. It's within the, tro the soundly within the tropics, which is you know, 20 degrees uh, north of the equator, or it's actually 22 to be specific, or 22 south. Those are the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn that define the tropics. Um, so that plant, when we grow it here, it grows 18 to 20 feet tall, makes a huge stalk. It loves these long days, but then it doesn't flower and make um, cobs until late September, which just doesn't work in our climate because we can have frost in early October. So it would take a long time to adapt those types of plants to our bioregion and probably by the time you're done adapting it which might be a hundred years or something of trying to grow seed every year and having awful results for decades until you get somewhere it would probably look like most of our north american indigenous corn varieties because native people already did this um, they did it without fossil fuels being able to transport seeds from Peru to Oregon, which we have now, so we try and do these crazy things. It moved hand to hand through people, through trade networks. So Teosinte, this is something to consider that's amazing about photo period. It, it went from central Mexico, Oaxaca, uh, you know, in the tropics, all the way up into different Canadian provinces where corn might be two feet tall, but it still manages to make a good size ear. And there's a great uh, video uh, TED talk that Winona LaDuke does where she talks about her uh, tribal corns, her indigenous uh, Ojibwe and Anishinaabe corn varieties. You know, they're just all the way up there to, you know, Winnipeg and Manitoba and stuff. But that didn't happen in one fell swoop. That probably took centuries. And 
as the plant you know went from being adapted at let's say 18 degrees north latitude in the tropics to 20 degrees to 22 and you can just imagine as it marched its way up little mutations and chance um, you know adaptations where it's cross-pollinating with the other individuals that could perform well in that particular um, set of growing conditions and eventually after a lot of time made its way all the way up there so i guess i just wanted to share a few thoughts about getting you to relate to the sun and day length in a different way um, because for me every year i observe nature uh, as a gardener and farmer i ask more questions like this and begin to ponder um, different things like this so you know for instance one place this has led me in my curiosity was I came across some soybeans, a variety called Busan from North Korea. And I, I know from doing this study and geeking out on it that North Korea has the same latitude as where I live. So whatever seeds grow well in North Korea are probably going to do well here. And this particular soybean was an edamame variety and the seeds are uh, half kind of a gold green and half black in a yin yang kind of pattern. And uh, the information that came to me with, at a seed swap was this, this particular variety had 61% protein, which is astounding. That's so much for a vegetable. Uh, it grew pretty tall. It grew about three feet tall here and produced well. So I started one, one little seed packet last year and that got me up to maybe having a pound and then we'll plant it out this year and have more. And quite possibly I short-circuited having to trial many different soybeans that were adapted to different latitudes by understanding the photo period adaptation of a variety. And you could do the same thing for fruit trees or you know, any number of things. And so hopefully you're able to take this information and be successful. And I'll, I'll create a companion video where I'll do a little tour of our glass house. We have a 16 foot by 85 foot glass and pole frame and cob uh, greenhouse we built, very cheap out of recycled windows. And I can show you what's growing in there six years later and without any supplemental heat whatsoever. And we've got all types of citrus and pomegranates and olives and bananas and sugar cane and so I want to encourage each of us to decentralize our food systems by growing as many plants as possible. And Thomas Jefferson was famous for have, having had said, and oh, if only our politicians could all be like this. Not that he was perfect, but at least he cared about gardening. Thomas Jefferson once said, I think the most important thing that a human can do is introduce a new useful plant into cultivation. Wow. So I want to get more of us to decentralize our food systems and decolonize our diets and get off of the Walmart, um, you know, semi truck, uh, ag subsidy, petrochemical um, paradigm. I mean, that's not a good one. So this is known as decolonizing your food system. And I'm not going to lecture you here about that. Uh, the reasons for doing so should be uh, painfully clear in these times. And to decentralize. So decolonize and decentralize. Make it local. It's so great like, for me that we can go into a greenhouse and harvest citrus. Or I just uh, brine cured olives that I leached in the creek for two months that we grew ourselves. And sure, it's just a drop in the bucket right now, but I'm learning what species work and then I can learn how to propagate them and plant more of them and get my neighbors to do it and share little videos like this so that you, wherever, I don't know, maybe you're in Russia or something, can do this and, and be successful. Because when we, the true power lies in strong agrarian communities that are well networked where we can look after each other and Pardon my little soapbox here because I'm sure there's people out there saying like easier for you to say, um, you know, privileged white male. But I feel like that's one way we begin to decolonize is those of us that recognize that we have an advantage here in this, like my paradigm in the United States. How can we share 
uh, and help those that are less fortunate than ourselves. And uh, for us, we send tens of thousands of packets of seed all over the world, anybody that asks. Uh, you know, mainly like school gardens, prison gardens, uh, native reservations, uh, these types of programs. Uh, Christian relief uh, groups working in Africa uh, with people whose lives have been hammered by you know, centuries of mining and colonialization. So this is how we, you know, kind of deconstruct that paradigm and then distribute it among those in a decentralized way where we actually have genuine relationships with. So, you know, for our area, maybe a 50 or 100 mile radius, like those are the people that I actually may see and interact with on a regular basis. So I don't know what the answer is for this whole country or this whole world, but I can work in my area because I have a few ideas after farming here for 25 years of what works and what you know what are the important calorie crops and a lot of it is informed by the sun and photo period and what can we pull off and yes like for instance i love sweet potatoes we can grow them it takes a lot of back bending to pull it off and it's hard to cure them where they actually sweeten up so they're really just kind of starchy so why not just grow regular uh, potatoes which people call irish potatoes and they've got it totally wrong they're andean potatoes people we should give credit where credit is due whenever possible. So again, these, these decentralized food systems are where all of us came from. We all came from roots of decentralized food systems. Grocery stores are a novel uh, creation in the last 80 years before World War I. They didn't exist. You had to know your butcher. You had to know your farmer. You had to know your milk producer, uh, your dairyman, woman, or do that yourself or hunt or fish or gather or something and probably a combination of all of that because no one can do it themselves so get in tune with the sun that's my advice to you get in tune with your water because you can have all the sun in the world but it's not going to help you grow anything unless you have water and i'll close uh with that you know just that get in touch with the, those basic rhythms those elemental forces and i feel like for myself, they've taught me a lot, and uh, hopefully you'll find something of value in this share, and uh, I'll be doing a few more of them. I, I, I see this as a, a crucial moment, a turning point in human history where we can do the right thing or we can do the wrong thing, and probably both will be happening simultaneously, and it's gonna be really hard to figure out what to do, but I know that growing plants to feed yourself, clothe yourself, make your medicine, is always going to be the answer because I don't want to be part of no techno synthetic biology experiment. And hopefully, you don't either because it's not a good idea. The earth is rocking it, so go with that, learn from that.